Good afternoon and thank you very much for joining us. My name is Alex Hayes. I'm Head of Development for Arts and Divinity here at St Andrews and I'm delighted to be introducing uh, former Scotland International and our current Director of Rugby, Scott Lawson, uh, who will present this latest in our series of Saints talks uh, entitled Six Nations to St Andrews, Learnings from Different Rugby Environments. Uh, given Scotland's uh, tremendous win against England a couple of weeks ago, we hope we might be doing this talk off the back of another victory against Wales at the weekend, uh, but sadly not to be. Uh, but uh, we nevertheless have high hopes for the remainder of the, of the Six, Na Six Nations. Uh, Scott was appointed Director of Rugby at the University in 2018 after an extensive international career playing for Scotland. He joined the University from Newcastle Falcons, bringing a wealth of experience playing rugby playing Premiership Rugby for over a decade. Scott started his rugby career at Bigger RFC before earning a professional contract at Glasgow Warriors and spending four seasons playing in the Pro 12 before a move to the Premiership, spending a season with Sale uh, before then moving to Gloucester uh, for four years. He is uh, a vastly experienced former Scotland international with 47 caps, uh, which include a try scoring performance uh, in Scotland's opening match of the 2007 Rugby World Cup, uh, and he also appeared in the 2011 tournament. In addition to his playing commitments with Newcastle Falcons, Scott uh, was director of rugby at National 2 North Club Tyndale RFC, uh, and he's previously been an elite specialist skills coach with Scottish rugby and a member of the Scotland Under 20 coaching team during the Six Nations and Junior World Cup. Alongside his role as Director of Rugby, Scott, Scott is also the Defence Coach at Stirling County RFC uh, in the Super Six part-time professional league. So leadership and cultural principles can be applied to all institutions and departments in an institution, regardless of the sector. And in this talk, Scott's going to discuss how he's used experiences from his previous career in professional rugby to grow and develop the rugby programme at St Andrews. A professional player in high performing teams for over 16 years, Scott will discuss the methods he's using to adapt his coaching and leadership style to be relevant in a university setting. Using theory and practical examples, he will demonstrate how skills and learnings acquired from the one environment can be successfully transferred to another. Scott's going to speak for about an, uh, half an hour after which you'll have the opportunity to ask him questions and I warmly encourage you to do so. Please submit your questions in the chat uh, at any time uh, between now uh, and, uh, and when the talk finishes. Uh, and just to say, don't leave it too late because we will wrap up promptly at 6.15. So without further ado from me, uh, I'd like to hand over uh, to Scott Lawson, Director of Rugby for his talk. Uh, Scott, welcome. Hi Alex, uh, thank you for that sort of very very warm welcome and, and very comprehensive uh, sort of synopsis of my, of my, my previous career. Um, what I'd like to do in, in, in half an hour is almost just go through a little bit about my, my, my past playing career but ultimately what we've uh, put into St Andrews uh, since I've been here. So like I say, uh, 2018 to, to 2021 um, on this slide, said I was fortunate enough, and it was any excuse to, to, to get this picture up. And my last game of uh, rugby for Scotland was was in 2018, so uh, four or five months before I took up my role um, as director of rugby here. And again, similar to yourself, very disappointed that Scotland couldn't back up the victory. Um, but it's also also got a huge huge learning point for all, all involved. Um, and I'm sure Gregor and the rest of Scotland team will be looking to to bounce back and, and learn from that defeat in Cardiff. Fast forward three years, um, I was very fortunate enough to so the pinnacle of of being a Scottish player would be lift, lifting the Calcutta Cup and the pinnacle of being a, a St Andrews student or an Edinburgh student and being involved in the programme is lifting the varsity um, and we were fortunate enough to, to do that this year. Um, but what I really want to do is almost go through the journey um, that we've been on together as, a, as an institution, as a rugby club, um, because it wasn't sort of playing sailing. Um, if you refer back to sort of 2019, 
Um, we went to, to Murrayfield uh, in the varsity match and with very high expectation and, and very high hope with myself, my, my second year, my, my first full year um, of being in charge uh, of the rugby programme here at St Andrews and we were defeated 62-0. Um, and through this talk and through this presentation, I would like to almost give you some of the kind of techniques and insights, how we managed to turn that round, how within, within two years we went from a a 62-0 defeat uh, against Edinburgh to, to uh, two years down the line to turn that into an 18-5 victory um, and also the learnings that I made personally and that we made as a, an institution. So um, I'm going to attempt to call upon some of my practical uh, experiences from, from my playing days and um, from my coaching and also link to, to a little bit of theory um, I went on a, a real sort of self-development uh, sort of discovery uh, uh, journey to try and find out how to become a better coach, um, how to become a better leader. Because as a player, I feel like you were you, it was very instinctive. As you say, I had a, a, kind of a long and successful playing career. But when you go into that leadership role and that coaching role, you have to you have to um, try and develop yourself on a on an almost daily basis um, and. The, the kind of references I'll use during this talk are, are called upon by by authors, by by coaches, um, and very common uh, within the sporting circles that I um, uh, that I'm currently involved in. So, a little bit about myself. Uh, again, you mentioned my, my past uh, playing career, but uh, th this is the kind of environments that I I have sort of I've played in, uh, the competitions I've been involved in, and and the, some of the coaches along the way that have. Um, that that I've guided myself um, from a player and into a coach, and um, one of the biggest learnings when I reflect back on when I stepped into the role at St Andrews was the, the almost the, the the inability for myself to adapt to the environment I was in. Um, very very high performing environments, very very sort of um, pressurised, very very uh, results driven, um, and when I came into St Andrews. It, the university sector itself is, is completely different. Um, it's we're, we're dealing with student athletes. We're dealing with people with different priorities. Um, rugby and sport in general is, is very important to them, but uh, ultimately it's not as important and it's not the, the driving factor in the life as it was for mine. So, one of the biggest things that I had to 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 go through after that uh, defeat at Murrayfield was was discover discover the, the purpose of the rugby club. Um, and and what 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 the rugby club was about, I'd almost taken it for granted that that everybody within the the program wanted to to, to win games and commit and, and be as be as professional as they possibly um, could do. Because we didn't have a purpose for for twelve months when I first came in, we, we didn't have any values and we didn't have any behaviours. So. Without those values and behaviours, it's very, very hard to, to hold people accountable. It's very, very hard to create a culture. Um, and what what this I'm going to show you this the next three or four slides is is what what we went through um, after the the varsity defeat of 2019, and what we went to do. Um, what we, we we it stood us in very good stead to go on us uh, go on our journey to what ultimately led to success in two, uh, 2021. So. And I think the the big thing I, I would almost reiterate, I think regardless of the, the organisation, regardless of the club, the department, I, I feel you have to have a purpose. So the purpose is, is in short, why do we do what we do? Um, and without that, you you're, you can't really go and form your values and, and you certainly can't form your behaviours. And um, I'd been, been used to environments, taking it very, very much for granted that you were in a professional environment, playing for Scotland, Playing in World Cups, that everyone had the same the same out, outlook on the purpose of the, the team you were in. Whereas when it when we came through um, into the university sector, the university rugby club, that that, that differed massively. And myself and the, the players, we weren't aligned um, with what we were trying to do. Uh, so I think almost a bit of advice and one of my main learnings from say from professional rugby and and into into. Uh, student rugby and uh, especially at St Andrews was what was the purpose of the club um, and I think that can be applied to to, to all walks of uh, business, organisation, departmental um, leadership. When you finally have your purpose, um, 
you can you can have a look at your values. How do you, how do you wish to do things things that, that underpin um, your, your purpose? And finally, how you then behave um, within 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 your club, within your within your institution. So, and I think especially with the students, especially with the 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 age band of where people are within the life, I think that was hugely important, um, and it, it means we can we can move forward and, and have a real common ground. So what we do, the, the, one of the first things, that, as I say, we had to we had to discover what the purpose of the University of St Andrews Rugby Football Club was, and through various meetings and various um, exercises, this this was what was what was ultimately uh, discovered and, and came up with by by the players themselves, both male and female, um, really important, uh, as the club is is, is not just just the, the men, uh, it's the, the men's section, the women's section. We've also got a mis mixed touch uh, section. Um, a lot of my, my work is done across uh, all areas, um, but for the high performing element of it, uh, with the, the kind of the varsity match, it sits mainly with the men um, on this example, but it does does apply to everyone in the club. So it was about finding it. And for myself, there was there were certain words that, that came up and certain expectations of a rugby club that I hadn't experienced so that distinction between the university and the club was, was really important. Um, making friends and being part of the community um, was another one. Um, fun, a huge, huge part of, of university. Uh, rugby, integrate rugby and social. Uh, stash was one that kind of came up and it's, for, it's almost a kit and the brand that you wear. And although it's everyone loves wearing sort of uh, loves wearing getting kit and wearing kit. It, it does create that unity and it was very, very important. So the purpose of the, of the rugby club had to be explored first. Um, and then this really helped help myself and helped everyone else to to find a way to bring success, to, to find a way to, to shape your values um, and shape your behaviours. Um, I'll, I'll move away slightly from, from, from the, the rugby club at the moment, but they kind of find a way, and for, for those of you that um, uh, sort of follow certain sports, uh, say whether it be football or rugby or um, anything else, there, there's always there's always these sort of ways and, and things to do things. But within rugby, one of the the, the common way that people talk about is the Saracens way. Um, I, I, I do know they got they got themselves tangled up in some salary cap and financial elements, but they they really they they created values and they created behaviours as you can see in the middle, and they really formed it as a Saracens way. And off the back of that, they became European Cup champions, they became double Premiership winners. So they really really promoted and lived by uh, by their values and their behaviours. Another way again is, is the Barcelona way. Um, a very very popular book within within leaders and aspiring coaches, uh, written by Damien Hughes, who I was fortunate enough to to work with when he was involved with Scotland, um, say in two thousand eighteen, uh, with that kind of Calcutta Cup victory, um, and they talk about how Barcelona have done things culturally, how they, they grow their own, how they have a philosophy and an ethos. So that is all sort of very very well and good, and as I, as I learn through this process, or I I, I did learn that. You can't cut and paste a, a kind of professional rugby environment. So you can't can't copy copy Barcelona and, and try and find a way. Um, so what we had to discover and, and what I went about trying to do was was to discover the St Andrews way. Um, and the main reason for that would be the just the kind of commitment levels of of, of the players and their their the, the different desires. Um, the, the, the study, the social, the rugby commitments, and it was really important to find something that would work, because if you just try to cut and paste or, or, or adopt a professional way or philosophy and, and imprint it into the university, as I discovered to my to my detriment in my first year um, in charge, it, it almost fails. You have to find a way that's relevant to to the the environment and the organisation that you're working with. So. Off that, we, we we formed we formed our values, um, and for what we tried to do, and what we really tried to um, emphasise was was to keep it simple and and something that could it didn't have to be. When you're a professional rugby player, you you live and breathe the program. It's it's your job. It's your livelihood. You get everyone working towards the same goal. But 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 student rugby is different from that. There's I'll, I'll touch on a, a kind of a, a priority pyramid and. 
the kind of elements we you try to uh, improve and emphasize with the students but the kind of the values we put in place had to be simple they have to had to be accountable and they had to be relevant so very very simply put was we want the values that we wanted to put in and in, into the club was that people had to, to look to improve every time they turned up to a session whether they be a first team player a fourth team player part of the women's section mixed mixed touch they had to look to get better um and that's something we really really valued as a club um and, and secondly was be a good person it was it was it was pretty simple but we, we wanted to to emphasize that it, it was more than rugby it was it was how you conducted yourself in in, in town in away trips um on the field off the field and i think it just encapsulated what we wanted um and again one of the one of the really good leadership books that people people constantly uh, continually refer to is legacy um it's about uh it's about the all blacks and the the, the beauty of the, of the book is the simplicity of how the all blacks do things they really focus on their core skills you look at uh, getting better every single session and they look about being a good person they, they talk about sweeping sweeping the sheds tidying up after each other they talk about leaving the jersey in a better place but it really is it's just it's just being a good person and i think it's something that we we wanted to to put into the rugby club uh, but also that transfers uh, beyond uh, beyond beyond the university beyond beyond the sports department um so we also then once we had our values we then we looked at our behaviors um and we again we wanted to make it relevant to every single person that was was uh, a member of the rugby club it wasn't about your skill level it wasn't about how, how fast you could run it wasn't about how good you were at rugby it was something that every member um regardless of ability could be could be judged on and and i'll and i'll i had a, a big hand in this um, I feel like when you lead a department or you lead a, lead a team, you, you're putting your name to it. Um, and I feel like if I had to go through my journey of uh, three years, my first three years in charge of, of the, of the programme was year one, I was very, um, I was, I was moulded and, and driven by the professional game. I tried to do things my way um, and I tried to impart my professional knowledge and my professional uh, way of thinking onto the students and, and it didn't work. Year two, I feel like I was very open minded and I went back and I listened to the students and, and got their feedback. But in hindsight, I believe I went too far the other way. I gave them too much autonomy. I I, I lowered my own standards um, to, to suit the, the students uh, at the time. They turned up with, with not on time, not giving maximum effort with a poor attitude. And I'd almost softened my own my own personal values. and something else that when you're when you're leading and you're you're, uh, and you're trying to be a mentor to others you can't you shouldn't um, allow your own personal values to be compromised and for me the, these are my personal values uh, when it comes to all walks of life but it's something i want to see in, in the rugby uh, members of the rugby club and maximum effort all the time with a, with a really good attitude and um, timekeeping uh, is important to me and also your communication skills your communication is things like you say you're going to turn up to training you turn up to training when you're available for games you're available for games if you're injured you, you, you communicate and say you're injured and it allows the whole organization to to function better on the timekeeping element and um, again because it's students it's uh, things like lectures tutorials they will always take priority but if we have a session at half past eight in the morning and um, you've got to turn up for uh, turn up on time for that. Uh, if you've got a lecture that starts at f uh, ends at five o'clock and training starts at five, I have no issue with people being late and as long as they let me know and they communicate. Um, and then ultimately when they're here, they've got turn up with a great attitude and put in maximum effort. Um, and it's, it's something that we, we we try and we try and install and we have done over the past like, 12 to 24 months. Again, I mentioned the kind of my, my sort of priority pyramid as, stu uh, as such, and, and how it differed, and, and how I learnt that uh, that it changed from from the professional environment to to where we are now um, within within the university. And I think I've had to to go through your your, your priorities, and I, I've got to I, I learnt very very quickly that the priorities of the students that come that come here is their studies. They are they are at the number one university in the United Kingdom. Uh, 
they have to leave here with with the best the best degree they possibly can do and there's no sport or, or social activity shouldn't influence that um however the the student experience and it's something that st andrews has prided itself on is is critical i think it's something that we we, we do we do put an awful lot of of emphasis on and i, I believe sport and social could have a, a huge part to play in that um so yeah let's say studies first have a good time experience university to the best uh, it should do and then your, your sport and social but I, I believe if you if you uphold the club values and, and behave how we've uh, how we've discussed you'll have a far better experience and as, as a result of having that better experience you'll be a far more rounded individual um, and you should excel at your studies um, something also I, did, I forgot to, to mention in the previous slide was, was timekeeping um, it's not just about uh, turning up on time. It's also a huge part of of time management, of uh, of knowing when your lectures are, knowing when tutorials are, knowing when deadlines are. Um, everything we do here is is geared around um, around your studies, and sport should be able to be maximised given the time frames allowed. So off the back of having a having a. Our find, discovering our purpose, um, discovering our club values, and then having a, a real kind of strong emphasis on, on our behaviours. Um, we, we went into looking at the, the traits of, of our members and, and what we wanted. And this again, this is this comes from the students. This is uh, not just it's certainly not my words, but this is uh, encapsulates what what I think it means to be a member of Saints Rugby, but, but hopefully what it means to be a, a member of of St, uh, the University of St Andrews. It's we want to have successful people um, that's on the field and off the field and um, very, very similar uh, ambition. So we, we want to we want to go and win varsity. We want to go and play in the best league possible, but we also want people to be ambitious um, out with out with the rugby programme as well. Um, inclusivity is a huge part of it. Um, again, we've recently sort of adopted a, a one club policy and it hadn't always been like this. So we've got one social media account. Um, the men, the women, um, we've got sort of joint exec committees um, and we're really moving towards pushing that club, club ethos. It's not men's club, women's club, mixed touch. It's it's everyone moving in the, in the, the right direction um, from from where it has been previously, but also the, 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 the sociable element of it as well. We want to be inclusive to, to all members. Noteworthy, I think that's that, that's really important. I, I say we talk about we want to be, we want to achievements that are, are noteworthy we want to we want to win varsity we want to do big things we want to um excel in everything we do um traditional i, I think it's a you want to be traditional but we also want to be forward thinking as well and i think traditions that have stood for for hundreds of years uh at the university very, very similar to um the length of time the rugby club has been in been in operation but, but also in, introducing new traditions I think it's something that we, we want to do. Traditions can be started um, and you want to leave that legacy behind in a way. So one of the things we, we, we brought in place this year was that, that after every game, we have to take a picture um, and that gets sent in and it gets put on a, a drive. And I think it's it would be a waste with this kind of new modern age of, if you want, technology and phones that uh, we, do, we don't mark these occasions because sometimes it, it, you look back and you jump in a box and there's printed pictures and there's black and white pictures and, and I was a little bit kind of apprehensive that some of the, the achievements and some of the memories we created would get lost because it would be very, very digital. So the plan is to, to print these out, to, to, to store them away somewhere and, and hopefully in years gone uh, years gone by people look back and and see and remember some, some really good uh, good achievements. And and huge part of the university life and university rugby is, is the, the social social aspect of it. Um, and it's, it's something that lines in with tradition and um, inclusivity as well. So, yeah, but these are not not something we touch on too much, but the, the traits that we want to see from all our members. So we talked about how we kind of form our, um, formed our culture as such. And again, I'm going to refer to, I'm, I'm not going to read it out. I'm, I'm going to refer to the, the, the Barcelona way, and it was through Damien Hughes' his work that he, encapsulated various models, how, how high performing sports teams work. And again, I, I looked at this and potentially when I, when I first came in, I thought well, it'll be a one size fits all. We can put this type of model into the into the, uh, the University Rugby Club. And it's it's very difficult because I think that the landscape of, of university sport within the, sex, uh, within the sector 
doesn't doesn't allow you to do that. But the one the one area that I'd really want to to focus on and I, and I do use is the is the commitment model. So so we are an inst not an institution and, and not a rugby club that 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 prioritise sport over study over um over over experience. But I think so so to have a successful rugby club, I really need to really need to to help make uh, get the members to commit. Uh, to, to, we've got a kind of bit of a, a sound, but everything you do within the rugby club is a choice. So you, you choose to turn up to training, you choose to turn up to games. Um, go to the gym, you choose to prepare uh, the best you can do. And the commitment model is the closest um, element I can see that links with, with what we're trying to do. And it's it's very clear that you, to have a sort of commitment culture, a commitment model, you have to, um, the, the culture has to be defined and has to be engaged with the, with the students. And through this process, I, I hope we've, we're, we're on our way there to do that. Um, and again, the last sentence, unlike sports, studies have shown that business um, that have adopted this isn't sustainable or it doesn't lead to long term success. But hopefully within sport, if you've got a strong, strong commitment cu culture and um, it will continue to stand you in very good stead, because actually, especially for, for St Andrews, we're not in a way to have to adopt the different models. Um, it's, it's a rugby club that's designed for, for students that, that are high achieving academics that want to come in and be the best they can be. So that's that's the, that's the St Andrews way. Um, it's not pigeonholed. It's not um, it's not able to define in a, in, a, in a simple way. But I think again, it's almost advice and from from my experiences to 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 say that there is no one size fits all for organisations. I think it's very very easy to try and say we'll adopt this uh, strategy or this model or this or this culture. And my biggest learnings um, is that I can't take things that I did in the professional environment and, and fit them straight into the university. One of the main things that I've tried to do is, is take different learnings from different environments, so different clubs, different tactics and, and little things. But ultimately, I think it's, it's finding the purpose of the, the, the rugby club was my biggest uh, biggest challenge and, and most productive one that I had to, to align the, the members with, with the vision and take them along, uh, along with that. And to do that, to find that vision, to find that kind of single purpose, um, it was about having influencers within the group. Um, it's uh, within sport. You talk about your your, your leaders and and your captains. But um, what I found when I when I first came in, I was very very. I tried to do everything myself, almost like your Alex Ferguson, Dean Richards type of people that I looked up through and, and thought that's how managers and coaches operated. But I got a lot of resistance from students and um, I was asking them to turn up to training. I was asking them why they weren't doing this or why they were behaving like that. And it was actually getting me nowhere. Uh, I was getting, I was seen as the kind of the adult, the, the school teacher type of figure um, within, the, within the, the student body. But what I quickly learned was I could influence large numbers and, and large uh, pockets of the club by using, by using uh, senior players, by using the friendship groups. And, and and almost getting my message across um, in a in a peer to peer uh, manner rather than kind of dictator and, and head coach to, to to student. I think that was my one of one of the key things. So I, I almost a really good example of that was um, there's been somebody a really talented player in around the second fifteen um, not turning up to training and expecting to play on a Wednesday. So so instead of myself, you have various conversations. You get you find out who his friendship group is. You find out who his best friend is, and you ask him to. To, to encourage them to come to training um, and hopefully the, the message will go in. Um, if you get your friends encouraging you to come to training and, and improve and buy into what we're trying to do, it'll, it'll carry far more weight. Um, we have also been, from a, from a high performance side of things, we've been fortunate enough that we've brought in some postgraduate scholars um, in the past couple of years, uh, past couple of years, which has allowed us to, to put people um, who have been part of high performing teams who have got a, a, a world class education from other institutions and then are studying and playing and still committing to the, the performance programme that we put in place. So uh, instead of myself asking people and, and telling people they need to turn up for training, they need to do their, do their gym, they need to look after themselves. But we have role models within the club now um, and they've been hugely influential in, in, in getting to where we want to go. Mm -hmm. I just just about the, the some of the other methods that have been adopted uh, by myself and some of my learning. So, yeah, we've, we've got our, our Saints, Saints training method. 
Um, so we've, we've kind of created it as, as GPS. So we need to have games. Um, we do everything to try to do everything or as much as possible as we can through games because they're fun, because they're enjoyable. Um, it creates a good learning environment. But for myself, they, they need to have purpose. Um, there's no point in playing a game of touch or, or sort of messing around at training. Um, all the games we try to put in place um, have, have purpose. And through this, through these games with purpose, we try to develop skills, structure and strategy. It's, it's, a, it's a challenge. It seems like you're just playing games of touch or, or just um, constraining uh, certain elements of, of, of training. But I think it is a really good learning environment, but also it's quite hard to, to get all your skills, structure and strategy in, into games. Again, back to my learning. The reason that I have to, had to adopt this method is if you look look at the, this is a standard uh, professional rugby training week. And um, this is what I say, again, what I was used to for sort of the best part of 15, 16 years of my life. Um, just the amount of, of, of meetings, the amount of rugby, the amount of weights, the amount of uh, organisation and support that you get as a professional player allows you to compa uh, sort of comp compartmentalise your training and, and how you learn. Um, huge hours and hours per week of learning opportunity. Um, not always the most constructive, not all the, always the most stimulating, but being my job, it was something that I was almost institutionalised in. And then you drop into a student environment and then this is our standard training week at the moment. Um, so you look at the the opportunity for, for, for time on task, it is very, very limited. So the skill as a coach, the skill as a, as a uh, a leader within that um, is, is to try and maximise your time while also being enjoyment, uh, so sort of putting enjoyment high on the priority list and, and engagement. So, yeah, with the GPS factor, we use the, the games with purpose, uh, your skills, structure and strategy um, is to try to maximise our time and, and increase experience. I'm very, very conscious of time, and I want to I want to touch on this very, very briefly. Would just would you be followership? Um, it's something I'm I want to explore further. Um, I think people with all within all organisations um, discuss followership, uh, discuss leadership. Sorry, but we don't often spend a lot of time on on developing our followership. Um, how how the how the group group follow us, and I, I learned very, very quickly that. The way I was leading meant I didn't have good followership, but I feel like by going through the process that I went through over the past two years and understanding your purpose and, and, and creating values and, and having behaviours, you create good followers. Um, there's still not a huge amount of um, work to be done on that within within the club and um, say I'll, 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 I'll sk uh, skip over this briefly, but when you look at the amount of just leadership within sport, there's, there's 142 million options on leadership, but only to the best part of 370,000 on um, on followership. But I, ironically, you probably have far more followers within within sport, within um, within your departments than you do leaders. So I think it's something that can really be really be explored, and it's something my, my next stage of development uh, within the rugby club and within it, within its members just to to develop uh, followership. Um, and the main reason, and I don't mean to be disparaging to the students, but it's, it's a quote that the coachable kids become employable adults. So um, you want people to be coachable. You want them to, to have good followers, uh, followership skills, um, how to take instruction, how to learn, how to grow, how to challenge at the right time. Um, because the, the, the main thing we're trying to do here um, is, is not just win. See, I spent a lot of my time focusing on winning. The score really mattered. Um, whereas I think now I'm on on a more my uh, my targets have changed slightly my sights have changed I think it is about sending people giving them a really good experience leaving St Andrews with an outstanding qualification but almost sort of telling them that they can have they can have a really good time and still be fully committed to sport and when you get out of out of university you want to have that, those employable skills and and have those traits that we talked about um, to go on and have a, a successful career. Um, Again, one of the things that I had to learn very, very quickly was was it was about generational learning. Uh, I came from a, an environment with, say, uh, I played rugby from with 20 to 35. I was dealing with the majority of, of, of males between 25 and 35. 
dealing with that and, and then all of a sudden I was dealing with kind of 17, 18 year old to, to 22 uh, two year old males, females um, and how you how, how you coach those those people was different. Um, it was that that generational element of of, of learning um, and I think as an older older person you think it's a lot of nonsense but when you actually delve into the science behind it, um, the, the brain has changed um, our access to technology, our access to phones, um, Twitter, Instagram, just immediate feedback, immediate, uh, immediate sort of gratification for what we've done. Uh, yeah, the, the brain is, is being wired differently. And within that coaching element, um, I've changed my coaching as well because, see, they lose interest in, in an activity um, they're enjoying within 12 minutes. So how we try and break up our sessions is we change tasks every every 10 minutes. It's about being precise, it's about being accurate, it's about being high tempo, but it's one of the big learnings that I've um, I've discovered um, and I've taken it into other elements of my coaching as well. So just a, a few points to consider um, for yourself. I, I've talked very much about uh, about purpose, about values and behaviours um, and certain leaders um, and, and, and followership. I know I've just talked about it very briefly and then coaching across generations. So I'm hopeful that we'll go into a bit of a Q&A now and, and we can make, I'll, I'll happily answer some questions. Um, via Alex and we'll, we'll go from there. So just to thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's been it's been actually very beneficial for myself to, to go and document what we've done and and, and really focus on the areas that have that have improved us and we're looking forward to to evolving and improving all the time as a as a club and as an institution. Scott, thanks so much for that. That's been absolutely fascinating and really interesting to hear you talk about um, the challenges that you faced in sort of transitioning your own thinking uh, when you arrived at St Andrews and, and adapting. Um, there's a number of things I'd love to ask you about that, but I'm not going to because we've already got uh, 10 questions lined up uh, in the chat. So I'm going to dive straight into those uh, and start with uh, with Brendan McFarlane, um, who, sorry, bear with me a second. Machine's just going slow. So you should be able to see that now. So uh, good evening, Scott. Um, my name is Brendan McFarlane. I graduated in 2016 from St Andrews, now head of recruitment at Toulouse FC. I, I guess that's FC rather than RFC in France, a club that aims to sign young, exciting players. Uh, I'd like to ask you about player experience. Given the fact that you have a certain age group of students that you can select from, how do you replace player experience? Uh, in terms of age, can you qual qualify experience in other ways uh, other than player age or minutes played? Yeah, I feel this, and we didn't really go into the full story behind the varsity 2019. We had that that core of fourth years that almost graduated the previous year, so we were left with a very very young team. And one of do the things that I'm conscious of and mentioned sustainability of your program is is trying to get a really strong blend of of first year, second year, third year, fourth year across across all the groups um, and across all the squads um, and, and and always have a little bit of an idea of what's in your second team at the moment um, and try and pick a younger player in there that could potentially move up. We are and it is the the nature of, of university sport it is, it is a, it's a cycle that people are here for four years and, and they do, do move on very, very quickly. But what we, all, what we have to try and do is, is make sure that your first and second years that come in feel as empowered and as, um, as part of the club in year one as they do in year four. And I think it comes back to being, being a good person um, and back to our values and our behaviours. Um, as you'll know, the university environment they can it can be very dominated by older players but we, we try and give everyone a voice and it, it's, it's important that you don't don't lose sight of the if you're old enough you're good enough um, and we try as a, as a coaching group to promote that across our across our squads uh, i'm going to go to a, a a question that that uh touches on some some of the answers you just gave just there about uh involving uh players um right from right from the off uh, this is from Mike. How does the club deal with less capable players arriving these days? I lost 25 years of rugby after coming to university and not finding the club welcoming, although I went on to captain uh, the university volleyball team. Uh, 
but played rugby in England from age 42 to 56 years old and had a great time. So yeah, so how, how, do, we, how, do, we, how do you deal with those who, who are never going to um, be in the kind of elite group at, at that sporting level, but really want to be involved and engaged? Um, so just, uh, and it's, it's back to my experience, and I think I, when I first came in, I think we had a bit of a, a culture with that. I felt like it was very, it was very dominated by the first and second team. And what we've tried to do is we've tried to just make sure that the values that we put in place, again, just being being a good person, looking at our traits, being very inclusive. Um, we try and we try and cater for all. So so previously, so last year we ran a first team, second team, third team. But as such, the, the numbers were so, um, the growth that we saw at the start of this season, we, we actually formed a, a fourth team. So we had circa about 80 or 90 members in previous years, which was enough to fill sort of three teams on a weekly basis. Now our, our male members alone are up at 130. Um, our women's section is up to 30 or 40. And people can say that it's because of, because of COVID or because of intake or whatever, but but I firmly believe because we've 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 promoted and we've uh, we've really enforced, if you want, those values and behaviours amongst all members, but we're a far more welcoming place to be. And um, we get numerous people, and I, and I saw it when I first came in, people who weren't that experienced or weren't that confident would come, try for a couple of weeks, and then they would leave. Whereas I, I'm seeing larger larger groups of those people come into the rugby club and, and, and they then stay and then they learn and they, they develop and they enjoy it um, and my again if you have your, your strong cultural values your, your strong behaviors that that all members are expected to adhere to um it, it should transcend into a, a great experience for everyone involved and it almost goes back to your influencers if you outline that see i, I personally can't really influence the behaviors of of people out with the rugby club and social settings but if you have strong strong influence, influencers within that, they can control and police that um, in, in all circumstances. And, and I firmly believe our increase in numbers, not only from the start of the year, but currently has, has been a direct result of us staying true to those values. Thanks. So, so on that kind of same topic of the influencers, I've um, got an anonymous question here. And you mentioned asking Pierce to speak to other players. What sort of things do you leave to players to sort out themselves? I, it's, it's it's almost as I wouldn't say leaving leave them to sort things out themselves, but it's almost being being a being a real go between between myself and and the players and it's things that I, I almost concern myself with the operational element of the rugby club. Um so things like training standards of, of kit, how we leave the uh, leave the, the kit sheds and so instead of it being like a like a teacher or a parent constantly uh, on top of them all the time. I try and use the senior members, and when I say senior members, it's not even necessarily the older ones, it's almost the, the people that are, are respected within first years and identifying who, who's got an audience, who can who can control the group. And um, But as far as say, uh, leaving them to sort things out, I think if you, if you, if you put your standards in place and uh, talk about my own personal standards, I think that does transcend into the rest of the group and they know how to behave. Um, again, I talk about my my year two. If I want, I left it to the to the students, to the to the to the to the masses to dictate standards, and you you only know what you know. And I think that's it. when you're in a leadership position, it's not about it's not having the stick. It's almost about having that carrot and incentivizing and guiding and showing. And if you do that over a long enough period of time, it should automatically filter through the whole group. Um, and and subsequently with myself, this is I'm I'm entering my fourth year. As director next year, so everybody that that joins the rugby club from September 2022, they are, they've all been subjected to my kind of my ethos and my this kind of process, and, and and it becomes just just a norm. You can you can you can create a really good environment by just making it normal, and then if as long as you do that, it just becomes a non-negotiable. It's a, it's not up for discussion how we do things, or it just let you let the the, the older students that have been part of this from from first year, um, just become good people. Yeah, and, and I guess as you say, that just takes you, you have to give yourself a few years for that to kind of embed itself in the in the whole group. Um, we've got a question here from the finance director of the university, which we better answer for political reasons. Um, but fortunately, he's asked a pretty good question. Um, on reflection, do you think your coaching skills have developed faster and better at the university than if you'd moved straight into the professional game? 
Uh, yes, without, without a doubt. Uh, it's, it's funny, I, I actually met, met Gregor Townsend um, on Sunday. He was up watching the, the regional under-17s and under-18s game that we hosted. Um, and he just asked how your coaching was going. And he said, like, it's coaching Scotland, coaching the Lions is actually is actually very, very easy. You, you're getting the best players within the country, the best players within within the, the organisation to, to work with. And you're almost just moving them around and manipulating them. But he believes that the true skill is, is dealing with players that haven't maybe had that um, coaching at a younger age and they haven't had that exposure to top level um, experiences. And for myself, I'm... I'm a far better coach because I've actually had to go through this process of learning and, and learning styles, generational, dealing with different people from different backgrounds. Um, if I'd retired from playing and went into a professional environment, I wouldn't have known any, anything different. I wouldn't have been through this process. So, so ultimately, yeah, I, I'm a far better better coach. I'm actually, I feel like I'm a, almost a better person because I've, I've had I've had far more self development than, than I would have done. I, I was put out of my comfort zone. If I'd just stayed in that professional coaching environment, it would have been, it would have been a different uh, level of coaching experience. Can I can I ask you a question myself? That just that's a follow up to that. Did you feel that there was ever any tension that you'd been hired as a as a top professional to bring, you know, that kind of professional game template uh, to St Andrews, and and then you know through the process you've described, you discovered that that was actually not going to quite work like that. Did, was, was there ever a tension there? Uh, no, I, I feel like it was to Stephen Stewart, the director of sport. He had, a, he had a, cl a clear vision that he explained to me that he wanted me to use my transferable skills and use my experience and, and impart it onto the uh, import, and, and impart it onto the students. But, but he was also fully aware that almost that priority model that their studies and their experience came first. The, the almost the, the mistake that I made was I tried to take that culture and that um, behaviour things that I had I had lived and breathed for sixteen years and expected them to buy into that straight away. Um, I still think that the values and the way you behave can be transferred, but it's almost the method of how you get there. It's that tell um, and just say. Actually, you'll probably look back in three or four years and we'll be in the place that I wanted us to be in. Um, but it's just taken longer, and it, but you've got buy-in, you've got investment. It's not been a, a straightforward line. It's been a very kind of progressive move back, move forward. But ultimately, I think it's the, the students and, and the members of the club that have came up with this, um, rather than just myself say, this is how I want you to behave. And, and that should lead to, to more sustainability and more buy-in. Yeah, thanks. Um, OK, let's... let's uh go to uh, uh, away from the university for a bit uh, and, and into uh, international rugby. So a question from John Carvel. Uh, in discipline in the Scotland team on Saturday against Wales resulted in many penalties and loss of advantage. How do you instill better discipline in an international team? I think probably Saturday, uh, probably really just highlighted that even the, the, say, let's say the, the, the top end professionals struggle under pressure. Like say Millennium Stadium, also Principality Stadium, Cardiff, Wales, it is the, one of the hardest venues to play rugby in in, in the world. And I, even your, your Finn Russell, Stuart Hogg of the world, they, they struggled under that pressure. And it just shows the marginal gains, the fine margins that these players are under. And you make, you make split second poor decisions and, and you get punished. But I think it's almost something that I, I, I refer to in my coaching at the uni when when they learn and, and so, so when they make mistakes that yeah people people some of the best people in the world make mistakes under pressure um, and it's how you cope with that very very frustrating because I, I do think this should have been could have been Scotland's opportunity with the quality of player that they had um, and I'm sure they'll, they'll go and work on that but it just it almost just shows that. Sport is so unpredictable and it's you're never the finished article. And again, having a, a lot of a chat uh, to Gregor on Sunday, um, he just he almost felt like a little bit of complacency. Um, I think we, we, we were the better team. We should have went down there and got the result. But we just, especially during that second half, we just expected it to happen. Um, and it's something that it's almost a, a Scottish trait that we don't suit being favourites, unfortunately. Um, but I do think it's, it's it's something we'll need to hopefully get a reaction for for the next game. 
Well, Eddie, Eddie Jones's attempt to uh, play that particular mind game didn't go too well, so we thought thought, thought it might be all right after that. But, uh, anyway, certainly. Uh, uh, um, so, a, a quick shout out here for the Kiwis. Uh, Anonymous says, "Thank you for mentioning the All Blacks, a Kiwi mother of uh, from a Kiwi mother of a student at St Andrews." Uh, always nice to have the Kiwis uh, uh, in uh, in Northeast Fife. Uh, I'm going to ask you some, two pretty similar questions here, um, uh, and perhaps you can kind of wrap up the answer in, in one. So from, from that record, uh, who graduated in 91, uh, it says, how do you how do you hold players and the club accountable to the behaviours that you're that you're seeking? Uh, and from John Drysdale, uh, regarding behaviours, Scott, do you apply a written code of conduct, almost like a standards contract? That every player signs up to and stands by, uh, with sanctions for repeated transgressions, or is it managed less formally than that? Uh, it's, 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 it's less formal. I think it's it's back to that commitment culture uh, model. We do not have, say, there's, there's no contract. The, the students are, say, first and foremost at university at St Andrews students. The, the, the rugby, the whole sports department is is almost extracurricular, but. What we just try and do is, is try and make them feel part of it. And it's you, you, if you if you don't behave or you don't live up to the values, you, you you're letting your teammates down. But as, as far as a, as a formal code of conduct, we don't have it. We, we have these things documented, and it's almost the the presentation similar to what I've done is is presented to the first years at the start of the year. This is what's expected of you. This is how you're expected to behave. Um, but there all there will always be people who, if you want, fall out of line. But actually. Um, I think that's part of the student experience. I think it is part of making a better person. And 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 myself, like I, yeah, you, you discipline them. Actually, the the best way to discipline them is not pick them or, or, or not let them train. Um, one of the best things you can do is say we're not a professional football club or a professional rugby club. So if people are late for a, for a, for a training session, 10, 15 minutes late, and they shouldn't be, they should. I'll just I'll just not let them train. That's the biggest punishment you can give somebody. Or you can almost guarantee they won't be late again. And yeah, if people misbehave or they get themselves in trouble, um, it's you're first and foremost, you're there to support them, you're there to help them, you're here to make them learn. So it's uh, it's, it's almost knowing in that environment. And that's, again, from my professional experience, yeah, you'd face big fines. You'd be, say, when I was at, when I was at Gloucester, it was, a, it was a hundred pound fine for, for every minute you were late. So you just, you, just, you just weren't late, but you couldn't possibly do that with the students. So it's finding various ways and various tactics to, to get them to buy into it, to, to understand it. So, um, But I firmly believe making mistakes is part of it. I think you come to university to make mistakes um, and it's how we how we kind of look after and, and educate and, and, and make better people at the end of the day. Absolutely. Um, question from Rob Lines. I coach kids at a local club. Uh, our senior playing numbers have reduced massively over the years, despite a strengthening youth, youth section. Uh, it's thought players drift away from rugby from the age of 16 onwards. Uh, are you seeing less players available and keen at university age level? And do you have any suggestions for how to keep players in the game? So um, from what you're saying about the growth, growth in numbers at the, uh, at the club at St Andrews, I, I'm guessing you're not seeing reducing numbers, but perhaps you could address the, the, the broader question about um, Keeping young people in the game. Yeah, yeah, we, we have seen a huge, huge upturn in uh, upturn in rugby. And again, I, I didn't want to mention it during this kind of this talk, but I think COVID has been a, a benefit from that. I think first and foremost, I feel like they've, they've not had rugby for a year, so people have been really, really keen and really, really um, energised by having something that they actually they weren't sure about. Actually, to not play rugby for for six months or nine months, they've came back and they've been really enthused by it. Um, so that's almost been a benefit of it. Um, as for that drop off at 16, I think it comes to it from, from enjoyment. I think it's one of the main things that I feel like it can get a little bit too serious, a little bit too structured too early. Um, if you enjoy something, you'll keep coming back to it. Um, and it's, it's easier said than done. Um, there is other distractions within life. The generational model that we discussed actually has a, a part to play in that. So hour and a half rugby sessions in the freezing cold under under a, a, a floodlight is not that appealing, but you can find other ways to do it. Making your training sessions 45 minutes, making it games based, 
making it fun, making certain challenges, um, being really inventive with it, um, and keeping people engaged and, and keeping people enjoying themselves and hopefully they'll keep coming back. But it's not just your environment that struggle with that. Um, but I do feel that rugby and university rugby in particular, you've got that captive audience um, and it's that four years when you go to uni that you really want to, to, to focus down. I think there'll be, you'll probably find a drop off that people that graduate from say from St Andrews potentially don't play after that. But hopefully what I'm trying to do and we've no way to capture those figures is they actually enjoy rugby so much they want to keep playing, but hopefully they go into an environment that they want to go and do that in. But yeah, biggest, biggest, almost very, very simple statement. If people are enjoying it, they'll keep coming back. Yeah. Um, from Gary, hi Scott. Sp sports, co sports coaching has evolved in recognising the importance of setting strong, positive cultures. What would you say has been the most notable change in coaching practice over the years of your involvement in rugby? I think it's the, out with the culture, is the, is the games element of it. I think rugby itself used to be very linear, very drill based. It had to be hard, it had to be fitness based, you had to be tough. Um, and that, and then as a result of that, people would occasionally drop off. But the, the inclusive nature of it, so again ourselves, we the contact element of rugby isn't isn't for everyone, so we've got a mi mixed touch uh, section. Um, the the learning through games is actually science has sort of proved that's the that's the way to do it, and that's the way to to engage with people in the long term because uh, first and foremost it makes it fun. But it's back to almost my my mistakes I made from that autocratic sort of uh, way of coaching at the start was you must do this, you must do that, and you can coach somebody with the X and Ys and they'll, they'll do that. But then when the problems come and the uh, the challenges and you're under pressure, you don't always react accordingly because you, you, you don't know how to think for yourself. So yeah, a games-based approach to, to, to coaching and learning has been the biggest transformation I've seen um, since my kind of early playing days into my early, early coaching days. Thank you. Um... Two, I mean, again, I'm going to uh, link two questions here. So um, one is, is from anonymous uh, 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 questionnaire. Are there any formal communications uh, with other university teams to share learnings? I'm pretty sure I know the answer to that, but I'll uh, be uh, good to hear your, your, uh, your response. And, and also, how, how do you choose a team captain? And then slightly on a related subject from Alison Leaf, uh, who uh, was a, a medic here uh, in the 70s. Are there still departmental teams and interdepartmental comp uh, competitions? I'm pretty sure there was a medics team in my day. If so, how do they get integrated into the core university team structure? On the, so I believe there's the Butte Medical Society, I think is the, is, is the rugby team that, that play in. Um, they, don't, they don't themselves have, a, have, have their own team, have their own... Um, whole sport, and I think that's again very generational. I think numbers of, of sport participation ha has dropped slightly, but we do have a significant amount of medics um, with, within the rugby club. So they'll, when they have their own external fixtures, they'll go and play uh, Dundee uh, medics or play Edinburgh medics. Um, we'll go and they'll, they'll do that. But yeah, we have some medics within the, within the, the rugby program um, for the for the shared learning. Yeah, we try. Myself and say, my counterpart at Edinburgh, we, we've massive sort of advocates for university sport and trying to raise the profile of it within the Scottish rugby landscape. We feel like, say, we're a rugby club of 150 people that put out five senior teams every single week and um, we want to try and raise the profile and, and share our learnings. And just, if you very similar to your question about myself becoming a better coach, uh, I, I'm passionate about rugby. Like I want people to play rugby. I want the game to grow as much as I want St Andrews to go. So, um, and I think our, our, our uh, friend from New Zealand. I think that's one of the best things that New Zealand do as a country is that every team, every coach, they speak to each other and they share, they share their knowledge and they share their learning, almost for the good of the game. So I think it's something that I'm, I'm, I'm very keen at, and I think it takes a lot of confidence, general ability to share what you're doing. But I think it's it's something that I've I've taken forward, and yeah, you're almost like an open book when it comes to things like that. And 
Sorry, Alex, what was it? The medal question? Then, then, yeah, then there was just the other question about how you go about choosing a captain. And I, I think we're going to have to make that the last the last one because we're uh, we're on our on our time limit. So what? And this is again, as you learn from other uh, organisations, and I picked this up from from Pat Lamb at Bristol. I actually I ask members of the squad to apply for the captaincy. So I think again, it would be very traditional that the coach would appoint the captain because he was the best player, the best leader. But with all these kind of positions, you have to want to lead. You don't want an apprehensive captain, and it's a very good exercise. So. And you might get people who you didn't, I got, we did it last year for the first time and I got two applicants from people that I wouldn't sort of think about as leaders and um, it almost told me instinctively these people want to be leaders, they want to be developed and you can spend time on them. Um, it's something we do with, with other positions, I know it runs the committee but we do it not only with the first 15 captain but the second 15 captain and the third 15 captain because outlining responsibilities of, of a, a student rugby captain is important but you have to lead the team you don't always have a coach there for the lower teams but ultimately it just it, it says to myself and it says to the group I, I want to do this uh, and then what you then do from that you then you almost have an interview and say well tell me about your leadership tell me about what you're going to do tell me about your your vision and, and you work up a, as a rapport um, and, I, and I wouldn't have done that in my earlier days. I would have just picked the, the best player that I thought was the best leader. But you you, you, you go through this process and it becomes, you get, you get a bet the, the, the right person for the job. Um, and you almost get two, two sides. You get you get coaches, captains, and you get players, captains. Uh, people who are the voice of the people, if you want, the voice of the players. Or you get somebody that's self-appointed um, by myself. But I think by doing this process, you find out who... Who really wants to be captain, um, and who who the, who the players want to be captain as well? Because I think they'll they'll sometimes have a, a better opinion on it than me. Thank you. So uh, that's great. We're going we're going to have to end it there. Um, I'm, uh, apologies to the few um, uh, people asking questions that, whose whose questions we haven't quite got to. Uh, there are some left, but we are we are unfortunately out of time. Um, but thank you all for asking such really interesting questions. Um, it's always a joy to to uh, to have those coming through. We 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 have a great community out there who tend to ask intelligent and, and searching questions of our of our speakers, and um, uh, it's great to see. Scott, thanks so much for sharing uh, your experience uh, and and sharing so honestly and, and directly uh, the challenges uh, that uh, that you've you've been um, uh, approaching with the with the role uh, at St Andrews. Uh, and how those are, uh, are beginning to bear fruit. Uh, I think we're all really looking forward to seeing what uh, what happens with the club over the next few years. Uh, it's, uh, it's exciting times and I think everyone's you know, great to be back with people playing competitive rugby again uh, uh, in the in the Bucks uh, and, uh, and and really putting that into practice on the pitch as well. So thanks so much uh, for, for your time in, in preparing your talk and for, and for sharing all that with us. Um, thank you to everyone who's who's been listening. Um, please do keep an eye out for our next uh, Saints talk. Uh, you will uh, you'll get an email about that uh, uh, as soon as we we have the details for the next one. And uh, thank you again, uh, Scott Lawson. Thanks very much, everyone.